Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, for the next 50 minutes, we are going to discuss uh, web mapping and the use of ArcGIS Online as a resource for teaching and uh, research and operational and administrative use too, if we have some staff members who are attending. We'll talk about those differences in the portal that we'll use. I uh, just wanted to mention initially that uh, the University of Idaho Library on their page has a GIS where software resources uh, web page you can go to. So if you go to the library under find, there's uh, a tab for GIS resources. And there's links out there to open source software as well as information about the ESRI license that we have. You can access their desktop applications and learn a little more about the uh, web-based uh, applications that are available as well. So ArcGIS Online is a cloud-based global collaborative platform. Esri hosts it, and we are able to use it to use and create and manage and an analyze uh, data and, and apps out there um, on this platform. The public-facing site is ArcGIS.com. Uh, there are public accounts that you can create that have uh, uh, a limited amount of functionality, not as much as our organizational accounts, but you can certainly create public accounts out there. It is a software as a service that is receiving quarterly updates. So there's a lot of active development on here. Functionality you don't see today might be available in the coming months on a lot of the popular uh, apps that they have. We've had access to this for quite a while, but it's continuing to be this evolution from GIS on the Esri platform being very desktop centric to now being very web centric. And the desktop application really becomes just an app in the larger web centric GIS platform. Uh, we're afforded access to this through a higher educational site license that the university pays for. So uh, all students and uh, and faculty have access to this for research and teaching. And then for operational and business use, staff have access to it uh, as well. I'm gonna cover a little bit about uh, the apps that are available on the platform. Uh, hopefully one or more of these is, is valuable to your discipline and the work you do. We'll talk a little bit about uh, data that are out there and exists that are ready to use and, uh, and are available to you. Um, I'll show a little bit about managing and sharing content and performing analysis on the web. We'll just touch on those briefly. Um, security and privacy, if you have concerns about that, Esri has a, a page that talks to, uh, to those issues. I'll uh, cover some of the learning resources that are available to us, and then I'll do a tour or demo, and I apologize for the folks uh, who weren't able to access their computers here, but if you're online, um, you'll be able to, uh, to follow along. So first, let's talk about apps on the platform. When we sign in uh, to ArcGIS Online through a web browser, there's a small three by three grid up in the corner, or some people refer to as a little candy box, which gives you a drop down of uh, a lot of these applications that we'll talk about today. And this list is longer than I show on the slide, but a lot of these will cover or give you direct links to these apps. And Esri tends to break them down into four categories of apps. Apps for mobile data collection. And, and if you're gonna do field work and you wanna use one of these, either connect in an internet environment or offline, you can do that. Uh, what they call apps for the office, which really kind of are best used at your desktop, you know, heavier apps like ArcGIS Pro, that type of thing. Apps for the community to share information. We'll talk about ways that uh, if you assemble data or applications and you want to share them with the broader community, uh, some ways to do that. And then app builders. If you make maps and you want to encase them inside an application, ways to do that for non-programmers and programmers. Okay, apps for the field. There are really three that have come to uh, the forefront. If you see one out there and, and information referring to ArcGIS Collector, which was popular, 
Um, ArcGIS Field Maps has taken the, the place of that, and it's really a map centric application for doing mobile data collection. Its counterpart, uh, Survey123, is really form centric, uh, more kind of like a Qualtrics approach. So uh, you could certainly use either depending on the type of data collection you're going to do. And then Quick Capture is one for. Uh, it seems like they target it more at uh, quickly collecting observations in natural disasters, that type of thing. Grab a picture quick. Not a whole lot of detail in what you can do, but it can be beneficial for, for rapid collection. So field maps is uh, emerging as their most popular one right now for map-centric uh, approaches. So uh, I do ha have that on my mobile device. It's, you know, App Store, um, Apple, you know, Android devices, uh, you can install it on, on many different devices. And all these are hyperlinked here. When you receive these slides, uh, they'll take you to pages that uh, give you more information about them. Now, kind of apps for the office. There's a bunch there. ArcGIS Pro, if you are a, a, a longtime desktop user um, of Esri software, you'll be familiar with ArcMap and Arc Catalog and uh, the newer software ArcGIS Pro that uh, will be replacing that. That's seen again in this web-centric environment as an app for uh, the web-based platform. If you're an Excel person, there's a plugin, Maps for Office. If you want to comfortable work in Excel, but want to add uh, some mapping capability to that, uh, there's a plugin there. Insights is uh, something that's available on ArcGIS Online, which is a lot of statistical and, and analytic uh, operations that you can perform more like Tableau, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that's, that's embedded in here. Notebooks is a newer one that's come about. If you like Python programming or you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, they have ArcGIS Notebooks. So you can do that kind of thing uh, on the platform. Other apps specifically for like business and community impacts and that type of thing. GeoPlanner, they've been working in architecture with a lot uh, for uh, scenario planning. ArcGIS Urban for city planning and Scene Viewer and Map Viewer are both uh, 2D and 3D web mapping applications in your browser. And we'll take a look at Map Viewer here shortly, um, which is really the web mapping component in 2D and ArcGIS Online. So if any of these sound familiar, or excuse me, uh, sound interesting or, or might meet some of your needs, I uh, encourage you to, to dive into them a, a little deeper. We won't look at all these in detail, but we'll mostly focus on Map Viewer here since it's a, it's a, a good introductory one for mapping from your desktop. Now sharing things with the community. Story Maps, very popular digital storytelling application allows you to take text and photographs and maps and create a multimedia presentation, essentially a website to tell a story of your research. And, and we've had a number of graduate students use this and, and others on projects to, you know, um, take the plethora of information they've put together and trying to organize that or the plethora of data and organize that into uh, to a friendly uh, format where they can tell the story of their research. Dashboards is another popular one. Uh, you know, a lot of the dials you see out there. And if you're familiar with uh, uh, one of the most popular or examples of dashboard use was the Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard that's built with uh, ArcGIS Online. So um, if you're used to seeing, you know, graphs or real-time data coming in, uh, you can map in that. You can create gauges and stuff that create this quote-unquote dashboard look. And then a hub has become very popular too uh, for community initiatives. So if you're going to work with you know, members of the public and you want them to contribute, um, you can create a initiative out there and it allows you to kind of create pages under hub where you can uh, work with folks in the community and share data and that type of thing. So that's another one to explore. There are two levels of hub standard and premium and we actually do have hub premium which gives you uh, uh, a little more functionality and that's under part of our site license we'll take a look at story maps hopefully we'll have time here to uh to take a look at that one out of this group uh app builders 
So the first three here are point and click, no coding required, configurable apps, or I think they're starting to refer to it. You might see instant apps um, is their terminology now. Uh, so look for either one. But uh, the idea is after you create a map, you can create an application that contains that map and it gives you a little more functionality for the presentation side to create a title and you know what buttons you might like to have on there and the interface that the user sees to interact with the map. So there's some of those, you could take a map and just select one of these instant apps and produce an application uh, from that. Web App Builder is very popular. It, gives you uh, themes to choose from, and, and it's a little more in depth than the instant apps. You have more choices for how you want to configure it. We'll look at that here um, before the end of the, uh, before the end of the presentation as well. Experience Builder is another one where you can build an app, dragging and dropping. And then the last two, if you um, like to do coding or programming, the platform uh, supports that through supports that as well through App Studio, or they have application programming interfaces and software development kits if you want to put together your own mobile app or, or uh, some other piece of software for uh, your community. So that's the app builder side of things. And again, we'll, we'll take a little look at web app builder just as an example here, I think. Uh, Okay, so on the platform, you know, we sign in, we'll sign in here. And prior to, you know, bringing any of your data that you collect into the platform, you have access to um, a lot of data that exists out there and is shared uh, currently. So from the Esri side, along with our site license, um, the Living Atlas of the World is a collection of information that they've assembled along with some of their business partners. And they make a number of those available to the public, but then some of them we have access to additionally through our site license, what they call premium content. So it's a good place to explore um, for if you're looking for some you know, base data uh, that might be helpful. Um, that you're going to put your operational data on top of. There's also many federal, state, local, tribal agencies who are sharing data through this platform, right? So um, a lot of them are shared publicly that you can get access to through ArcGIS Online, you know, just through uh, searching for those out there. Through just our organization, right? The library, we share a lot of uh, historical um, georeferenced uh, digital aerial imagery. So um, if you're searching through just items that are available from the organization, the library makes available a lot of aerial imagery. Uh, your colleagues, right? Um, they could be here or in another location on this platform, can share data and uh, acquire some ready to use data from them. Anyone on the platform can share data publicly. Um, you certainly you know, might want to vet that uh, and uh, investigate it a little bit um, if it's not by an authoritative source, but it can be shared that way. If you're someone who uses a uh, certainly a, a, a open source platform like QGIS or something, and uh, if you find data sets that are available in open formats like open geospatial consortium formats, you can bring those into the platform too if you're uh, GeoJSON or um, open web mapping services and that type of thing can be consumed. And then, so all these are available plus the operational data that you bring. Um, so there's uh, a lot of base maps here. Maybe you're looking for soils maps or fire boundaries or uh, you know weather information or that type of thing. Uh, there are a lot of sources out here from you know kind of a, a large picture, you know, global type stuff at the Esri and business partner level, down to your state, your local, you know, municipality, maybe uh, your institution, your colleagues. There's a lot of a uh, lot of options to get at information, both proprietary in the Esri format and in open formats. So managing and sharing content. 
um, this is a little snapshot of the web page in the browser that you'll see. There are several tabs across the top. There's a new one in here. It's not in this picture. It'll, you'll show notebooks will show up there actually um, along the top. But for managing and sharing data, the content uh, tab and the groups tab are uh, two that you'll become familiar with if you use this platform a lot. The content tab allows you to create folders and organize the items that you create. Uh, you could create a folder for a class or a research project, that type of thing. Uh, you can move items around in the content tab, right? Transfer them to different folders. And uh, you have the ability there to share items to designate sharing. And you can also link to all the details about a given item from there. And for any item, you'll want to create documentation if you're going to share it very broadly, right? You want to give it a friendly title and a, a summary abs, uh, abstract. Um, if you're going to share it broadly, you know, you might want to consider a, uh, a uh, access policy for it, like a, a Creative Commons policy or something. So you get attribution for it, that type of thing you can access from the content tab. It's almost like if you're a Windows person, kind of Windows Explorer to a certain extent for file navigation and, and managing your items. So the content tab will be, a, uh, be something you'll become very familiar with if you use the ArcGIS platform. The groups tab allows you to uh, share collections of items that you know uh, might be related to, uh, for example, a class. Maybe you have one for a course or a set of colleagues for a research project. And on the ArcGIS online platform, you create a group for that research project. And you know you name that group in a friendly way and create a description and create other information about that group. And then you have the ability to designate who members of that group are, who you wanna share data with, you know, how they can join. You can have a group where somebody could send you an invitation. Hey, can I join your group? Or, you know, you uh, invite them uh, at your own accord. Um, you can share a group, you know, publicly or uh, with, just your, uh, with just your colleagues. And then there's one other designation uh, called the shared updates, um, which is one you want to give some consideration to when you create a group because you can't change it after currently current functionality doesn't allow you to uh, disable that once it's been enabled on a group but if you have a group of colleagues um, that you want to be able to edit shared items items you own and you share with the group or others share with the group you can enable that shared update um, if you just want to share stuff where people view it um, you don't turn shared updates on. But I, I think the main takeaway is consider that um, when you're creating a group, and you can certainly create more than one group, but for a group that you enable shared updates on, uh, you can't change uh, that setting after. You would have to uh, unshare that content and, uh, and not allow those folks to edit it after that. Okay, that's managing and sharing content. The content tab and the groups tab. Two, you'll become very familiar with uh, if you use ArcGIS online. Let's talk just a minute about uh, sharing content, right? So by default, everything's private. You're the owner, you're the only one who can see it and you have to choose to share it more broadly. Um, the first way to do that on the platform currently is through groups. So you would create a group, you would uh, add members to that group that you wanna share it with. And uh, that's your first level of sharing. You know, people can be from your specific organization or they can be across the whole platform, right? Um, if you have colleagues or, um, you know, research partners that are working at other institutions, you can allow them to view data that you share from here. You can invite them specifically. Uh, one, the only current restriction, if it's a shared update group, it has to be people from within your organization right now. They don't allow cross-institutional editing uh, through a shared update group. But if you have somebody who works at a local government state agency and, and you wanna you know, not have your data shared publicly, but you wanna share it with a group and have them view it, you can do that. You can share items at the organizational level. So every member of 
our organization could see it. And we do that with our aerial imagery, right? We share that. Um, well, we do that with our licensed aerial imagery where we have aerial imagery, say for Taylor Ranch or the experimental forest, what's licensed and we can only share it for the organization. Um, so that's one example of uh, using the organizational setting that sharing level. And then you can share it with everybody, just the public, send them a URL, anybody can get to it if you set uh, the sharing for everyone. So you have the option to do that on maps and apps and groups and all items in ArcGIS Online. Uh, Geoprocessing. If you're someone who use, doesn't use um, ArcGIS desktop applications and you do want to perform some geoprocessing, there is some available in uh, on the ArcGIS Online platform. And here are a snapshot of some of those. If you want to dissolve boundaries or aggregate points, that type of things. A lot of the common um, kind of, I'll call low level GIS uh, processing, uh, you, can, you can perform um, on the ArcGIS Online platform. Now, if you're a desktop user, you'll know on the geoprocessing side, there's many, 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 many more tools that you have access to. But on the web platform, it's a limited set. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's ones that you might be able to commonly use up there to complete some tasks that are helpful in, in working with your data and performing analysis. Uh, but if you need a, a more advanced analysis and geoprocessing, you'll need to go to something like the ArcGIS um, Pro platform to do that. But there's a link in here that takes you all to all the analysis tools and uh, you can explore those further. Quick mention on security, privacy and compliance. Esri has a website that covers all of this. If you do have concerns, again, it's a cloud-based platform. Um, and if you know your research or grant or project, if you have concerns about that, um, you'll want to take a look at their uh, their information that they share out there. So I provided a link in here and for you to further explore after the uh, after the presentation if you have any concerns about that. In terms of resources and support after this uh, after this workshop, Esri has a lot of resources out there like blogs and tips and tricks and what's new, that kind of thing on their ArcGIS Online resources page. You can certainly explore those. We have access to on Esri training um, in addition to what they have out there to the public. So if you go to esri.com training and you sign in with your VandalNet ID, there are learning plans out there. You can access these self-paced modules. Some of them are you know, 30 minute introductions. Some of them are lessons plans that are you know, like eight courses or something of that nature. So you can get very in depth if you like that type of learning style. Um, coming this fall um, over here in the map room, uh, for those online on the first floor of the, uh, the library, we're working on the physical map space to be repurposed as a more collaborative uh, digital data space called the Data Hub. So we're uh, over here in the map room on the first floor, there'll be staff in there. And if you have questions, uh, certainly that'll be uh, a service point where you can stop by and, and talk to folks uh, that are familiar with, with these technologies. You can always reach out to me, be Godfrey at uidaho.edu. If you get stuck somewhere, or have a question or any time, uh, just feel free to send me, uh, send me an email and I'm certainly available to try to help you out. And then as part of our site license, we have access to Esri tech support. So if you get stuck, if you think there's a bug, um, if there's something we can't figure out together, uh, we can open a support case with Esri and get some of their knowledgeable professionals uh, involved and, and see if it's something we're doing wrong or if we've identified an issue with the software. Um, and that's a good resource. They're quick about getting back to us and uh, trying to solve, uh, solve issues. So let's uh, stop there. I want to spend the rest of the time giving you a tour or for those who uh, are online and, and have a computer, you can certainly follow along as we go here. For teaching and scholar research, research um, our subdomain is uidaho on maps.arcgis.com, right? 
Uh, so um, if you go to uh, that URL, uidaho.maps.arcgis.com, there's also a link to it from the library webpage, and sign in with your VandalNet ID, you will we'll be accessing uh, our portal for, for teaching and scholarly research. And I want to mention here that ESRI does provide us under the site license a separate portal for business operations and administration. So for example, facility services is using uh, that portal to, uh, to use some web mapping capabilities out there. And other units on campus can use that as well. Uh, but the distinction here um, being between teaching and scholarly research taking place at UIdaho and for administrative or business operations, we want to use uidahoadmin.maps.rcs.com. And that one, please contact me if you have questions about that. It is by invitation. Uh, again, we've got some folks in ITS and facilities and, and that type of thing using that. So let's take a look out here. Um, if you go to uidaho.maps.arcgis.com and sign in using the uh, blue button there, um, I'm already signed in here just to save us a little time, but you'll be prompted to enter your Vandal Net ID. And when you uh, sign in, you'll come to the landing page that has those tabs across the top that we talked about. And here's the little three by three grid that has access to many of the apps that are available there. Um, and you can go directly to, from here, for example, you could go directly to Story Maps, or you, know, you could go directly to uh, uh, any of these other apps that are, that are available here. So that's available. Uh, there's a little notifications tab. Uh, this is for searching ArcGIS online, but let's start with uh, the organizations tab, which, uh, provide you a little bit of information about who current users are on here. Um, you can contact me directly, some groups we have for information, uh, recent content that has been published at at least the organizational level that you can explore. The content tab here, as I was mentioning, is, is for management and, and uh, organizing uh, data. So from here, we could upload new items, right? If we had a uh, shapefile, for example, and we wanted to bring it onto the web platform, we could do it from here. Or if we had a comma separated values file, like a CSV that had latitudes and longitudes in it, and we wanna bring it up here, we could add that new item uh, from here. You can add it from uh, different locations like Google Drive and, and uh, you know uh, OneDrive and, uh, you can uh, import data from those other locations. Um, we have the ability to create folders in here, like uh, my project. And then we can store items just in this folder uh, that, uh, that we have quick access to. We can filter by a lot of different, if you get a lot of content, your ability to filter here, by the item type or when it was created or how it's being shared, that type of thing. So the content tab uh, becomes a place where you'll spend some time um, organizing information. After we create a map, we'll see it appear in the content tab. On the groups tab here, we have the ability again to create a group and we would give our group a name and add some uh, description of it and some friendly tags to uh, be able to discover it. We can have a nice little image for our group. And then we have you know, the options for these settings of who can be in the group, um, you know, how they are, uh, people can join it and uh, what they can view, who you're gonna share it with and that type of thing. And uh, so you'll set those uh, initial settings when you create a group and you can share items with that group. So we could create one called my group. I think I'll just take all the uh, defaults here and we end up getting a group, uh, our first one in our groups tab. We haven't invited any members, but we do have a group here and we could edit it and invite members over here to our group um, by inviting users um, 
I'm the only member here, but we can invite uh, more members to this. We can get back at our settings if we want to change them. Uh, we can set delete protections so we don't. Uh, Is it by email? Is it invitation? Uh, the invitation would be through here. Um, if you invite, you can search for anybody who's on the platform there and you would automatically discover them and you could either uh, um, add them without requiring confirmation or ask them for confirmation. Yeah. Are we all? The students were all already on here. Like, so that's what I'm wondering. If I wanted to create a group for my class and I'm I want to share this map with them, and I don't have time to give them a whole hour presentation about how to do this, like how am I going to access like be like, hey, here's a link to go to it? Right. You would just want them to sign into the platform first. Just send them the uidaho.maps and say sign in with your net ID. Okay. And that they would have to do that at this point we're not automatically added unless we sign in. Mm -hmm. So you would send them to uidaho.maps.arcgis.com and uh, just have them sign in with their net ID. And then you would be able to discover them. Yeah, so it, it's not quite, it'd be nice one day if we get integrated with Canvas, coming up with Canvas and it knows class lists and that type of thing, but uh, it's not quite there. I was thinking it was like kind of the Google Drive shared folder, but it's yeah, it's a little more. Yes. So we have a, a question from Bridge. Um, so if if you're doing the invitation, that's only if you want people to be able to see, like maybe data you have private. But if you create something in Story Map, you can just share that without them having to access our right? That's correct. If you if you share anything publicly, they won't have to sign it. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's only if you're going to have restricted access. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so if it's if. If we create this group and I make it public, you can just give me the URL. Oh, or it's, it's so, I, I was trying to think of a way to like make this kind of shenanigans. Like I have created content, I want to share that with my class. Do I just send them a link to the content that I have instead of making a group? You can, if that content's public, you can just send them a link. If you create a map, like we'll do here, let's create a map. And if we share that um, publicly, you can just send them that link to the map. Oh, okay. It's only if you want to restrict it to say the members of a group, the members of a class right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at the map tab real quick. Um, this is something you run into a short time right here is Map Viewer Classic was the original web mapping application on this platform. That's being superseded, superseded by something called the new Map Viewer. Um, you have a choice, you can use either one right now. New map viewer, you may want to take a look at because that's the one that's going to uh, last longer here. They're going to sunset classic uh, over time. But uh, you have the ability to choose either one. And um, I, I would choose one and stick with it because uh, if you go from the new map viewer, try to go back to classic, some of that functionality doesn't work. So uh, take a look at the new map viewer here. Yeah. Uh, so here is our web map viewer, and uh, just out of the box, before you, you do much with it, um, you have the ability to change base maps and, and you know, uh, show people what's going to be in the background on top of your operational data or behind your operational data. Um, before you even add content, uh, you can do measurements and things on here. Um, we can measure distances um, using different uh, units. We can look at areas um, if we want to calculate areas just roughly on there in uh, different ways. Um, we'll go ahead and get rid of that. We can search for locations on here, um, you know, like Moscow, for example. Um, it uses the gazetteer behind here, and we can find locations and zoom to them. So before you even add any content, you can kind of, you know, set up uh, how you want the basic map to look. Uh, we can bring content into here, as we talked about, just finding uh, readily available things. Um, we can browse layers that are out there. So if I looked under our organization, people who have shared stuff with the organization, we could add on here. 
Um, I don't have any content yet, so I won't see any content, but if I had a layer in here, I could add it. But let me show you the Living Atlas right here. Again, this is Esri-based information. We have access to a lot of uh, content that they make available that's public, again, and premium. But say you wanted like uh, USA counties. Uh, they have several here that Esri's published that look like they were updated recently. We can add that content. If you don't have a county boundaries map, um, you can go out to the Living Atlas and get it. And we can see it floods in here. And we can see uh, it has a border around every feature and uh, the interior of those features are filled. Now we have the ability to work with this and, and change how this looks on the web map, right? So we could come in here and edit the style and say we didn't say we just wanted to see the border and not the area in the center and we would take off the fill and the outline maybe we want to make a little heavier here and so now we have this uh, county boundaries map that shows all of those for idaho so we have the ability on different layers we bring in to style those layers by choice. Um, we could also filter if you only wanted them for Idaho, for example, we could filter out that content for the other states by adding an expression. Many of you are familiar probably with filtering data here. How about state name um, is... Idaho, let's see if it's in the list here. Enter. And then here, now we just have the county boundaries for the state of Idaho. So if you just needed Laytaw County, you could do it, that type of thing. Uh, so we have the ability, we could also put labels on here. We could label the counties, uh, the names on here. So if you wanted those to appear with labeling some attribute uh, of that, say we use county name, for example. And let's edit the style here. Um, I don't know, let's make it big. And we'll change the color here. And so here we've got those, whoops, uh, names set on there. Make it a little bigger. Okay. So now we've got some names on there, right? So we can add our content on here. Um, we can add content from the Living Atlas or other locations we can bring in. And now we have a map that we might want to share, right? So we've created this item and we want to go over and save that item uh, as a new map. Oops, let me see. Let me save this item. Uh, my new map, um, interest of time, I'm gonna leave everything else blank. So at this point, if we go back to our content, we should have one item. I should have one new item in my content tab here. And I saved it under demo user. I didn't put it in my project folder, but here it is, right? And it's only available to me at this point. Now, I could share that with a group if I wanted restricted access to it, um, or I could share it more broadly with just everyone or the whole organization here. And at that point, if I share it with everyone, it's available for anyone to go to that URL and uh, view it. So I'm not going to share it with a group. I'm just going to share it with everyone. And now you could send somebody directly to this map um, if you had interest in doing that. So that's, go ahead, Julie. Yeah, we have a question on chat. How long will the app slash data potentially map that we make exist? If I share data in this way this year, will it be available 10 years from now? Oh, I, I don't know that I could predict that far ahead. Um, what I will say, I don't know about 10 years from now. What I will say is uh, currently you have access to this platform as long as you have your VandalNet ID. Um, after that time, um, 
you know, when ITS sunsetted it, um, the content would still remain. We don't delete it. A public item would still be available publicly. We don't remove any at this time. Uh, ownership can be transferred um, to different people. Um, if, for example, on a research project, somebody left and they owned items and you want to transfer them to a different person, you could do that. Uh, I don't know, I can speak to 10 years ahead, um, what the technology will look like, but uh, uh, there are upgrades in apps where like any technology you'll probably have to keep up with. Yeah. So we, How long do we have, so you said as long as we have our manual ID, isn't that indefinite? Like don't we have it forever? Uh, well, students after they would leave. They have to graduate? Does someone mark that off in our system somewhere? Uh, ITS handles that. Yeah, I, I don't know how many. Yeah, I, that's ITS policy, I believe. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you if you had like a Vandal's official account when you, before you graduate, could you move your content to a public account but not have all the same functionality? Um, it, it depends on the type of content, probably. And right now. Um, Cross-institutional sharing or sharing between institutional accounts and public accounts is, is not really straightforward at this point, but it's a recognized deficiency on the platform and they're actively working to address. Um, some data sets, like if you had a, a layer up here and you want to export to a shapefile, you can do that or file to a database and take it with you, right? Off the web platform and republish it. Um, so, so, yeah, if you take it and put it into a view of interest to desktop, you can transfer it that way. Yeah, so there will be some options. Um, let's take a look at uh, uh, this uh, quickly here. So we have an app. Um, we could create a new application in here. Um, like I wanted to mention uh, like Web App Builder, for example. Um, so if I create an app and let's use Web App Builder and we'll call it uh, My App. And this is gonna be just a 2D one. And this is Web App Builder now. So we're creating an application that that map um, could be embedded in, right? So we have some examples on uh, how we want the layout to look. We have some choices on our color schemes and things um, that we can use. Um, we can choose which web map we want to put in there. I only have one. I'm going to go ahead and put it in this application now. And we can customize it if you want to zoom in on certain areas. Uh, we can get some previews of how it's going to look on different like mobile devices and stuff and see if the labeling is going to work. It's not going to be very good here. We might really want to change the labeling, um, but we can look at it on, on different devices. And uh, we can choose, you know, which type of what they call widgets are on here. If you want a scale bar on here, or if you don't want the location item. Um, if you want the search bar on or not on, that type of thing. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that you can have available on here um, for the application. And oops, I'm going to cancel that. And then, so once we look at this whole app and we get it where we like it, we save that app now, right? So if we go back to our content, we have a map and we have an app that contains that map. So those are two different items. And right now our, our map is shared publicly, but our application isn't shared publicly, right? So um, we could certainly do that and we can share our application publicly too. So um, right now we don't have any layers. If you bring a shape file in and you have a hosted layer or a CSV, you'd see another item here uh, that would be a layer. So we have uh, a map and we have an app um that are our two examples there the last one we just have a few minutes left and i wanted to go to uh so we did an app we looked at map viewer um, we looked at web app builder let's just quickly look at story maps since that's such a real popular one that people uh also like you have the ability to to create your own stories in here and uh put together a lot of different content um, we can embed that map inside the story map. Um, we can add other images in here. So my story, um, and we could, you know, begin to add content in here. 
And if we wanted to embed a map in here, uh, we could do that. We'd have our choices um, to put images, uh, put video in here, audio, uh, like a carousel, you know, to go through that type of thing. Um, in terms of a map, we can embed the map we just made in here. And we could uh, create application instead of web app builder, you could do this approach and have it embedded in your story. And uh, you can change some of the design here. You'll see the layout's a little different. And if we want a different look to it, um, we can do that. So this is just another app that we can use instead of Web App Builder, it depends on how you want to present this information and what's gonna work well for uh, the story you wanna tell or the experience for the user, right? So we can have uh, something that looks like this with a lot of information around it and all sorts of other content, or we could simply have the web mapping application um, that has uh, a different presentation, or if you want to, you can just share the web map itself. Um, it'll just be in that map viewer. Um, it depends on, on how you want it to, uh, to present. So we can have this, we can have this, um, and then we can go back and, and just have the web map viewer um, presentation of it too. So that's a quick look at several apps in there and the ArcGIS Online platform. Um, I want to mention just briefly that we have other uh, workshops um, under the Graduate Students Essentials uh, heading coming up and certainly take a look at those. And then GIS Day will take place at the Pittman Center on Wednesday, November 17th. So if you have an opportunity to stop by and look at some of the latest and greatest things that people are working um, with in geographic information and GIS, please feel free to do that. And if you have any, yeah, yeah, that's down by the bookstore. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry about that. It's, yep, down by the bookstore there. Um, it's probably gonna be middle of the day, like a 10 to three type of thing. Yeah, we haven't finalized the, uh, haven't finalized the schedule events yet, but that'll be coming out shortly. If there's a project with the area that we might want to present, do we just contact you or who's? Yeah, there'll be a call go out in the register or, uh, yeah, we will, we will send out, uh, like lightning talks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. So I hope that was helpful for everybody. If you have questions, those of you online, um, if you want to talk specific applications um, or there wasn't, you know, I didn't cover something that, uh, you know, um, that you're interested in, in this short time, feel free to reach out to me at bgodfrey at uidaho.edu. And I hope this is valuable to you. Um, it's a resource we all have access to and in research and teaching or in operations in the university, hopefully we can take advantage of it to share and, and manage geographic information. So with that, uh, any other questions online, Jaleesa, or can we wrap it up? You're good, everyone can say thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.